Although I guess we should be on stream now. You're live. I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> it's always like a big question mark. Of like, are we yeah, actually alive? Because there's know. a delay, right? Because <laughs> right. we can talk and I'm live on on this screen, but then on this one, on the YouTube that actually matters, mm -hmm. it takes a second to like connect and to be like, oh yeah, you're going live. Now I see us. Yeah. And yeah, now we're talking. It looks like we're fine. Yep. Cool. Audio is working. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to another Q&A. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Um, we got a lot of great questions today. Uh, thank you, Ben, for uh, collecting all of those from the community and for everyone who submitted questions. Um, just let's give some people uh, a few more minutes to, to join, and then we'll get started. So uh, Ben, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing well. I realize that I uh, may or may not have mentioned in the Discord that this is happening. So. Oh. Well, you should do that. <laughs> uh, you to uh, monthly Q and A is Lorev, and then a little red dot. Paste that. Um, Did we ever set up that uh, role for people who want to be notified? Probably not. We should do that sometime. Yeah, we should. Copy link. Let's directly link the YouTube as well. It's a good idea. Confirm. All right. Very highly professional here with our <laughs> live streams. Flying by the seat of our pants, honestly. <laughs> how's uh, how's your holiday season been going, Ben? Uh, mine's been going quite well, actually. I had a lovely, uh, very different, unique Thanksgiving. Um, I hosted for a bunch of uh, Mexicans, well, actually, one of them is Spain, Spanish, and one of them is Venezuelan, but they all live here in Mexico. Um, and it, it was really nice. I got to share some of the delicious food. Everybody liked the um, sweet potatoes nice. that I made. Um, and oh, yeah, but the, the funniest part was like very typically, we have the day off. So people kind of show up like at noon, you hang out, you have some drinks, so people finish cooking dinner. Um, but I was like, okay, I would like to not eat at eight. So I'll say, all right, we're going to eat at five and I'll say, be here at four 30. Uh, the last people were showing up at six 30. That's on brand. Very typically. Yeah. Very on brand. <laughs> uh, but it ended you got to do two hours early. Yeah. I should have, should have put it way, way earlier. Yeah. But it was really fun. Um, cool. how was your Thanksgiving? Week? I also made uh, sweet potatoes. I actually made it twice. Because uh, I did two different Thanksgivings and uh, improved on my recipe from last year. So it was actually better this year. I tried to, the, the first one I tried to make more sweet. So I was like Googling around to understand like why sweet potatoes are sweet and how to make them sweeter through cooking. And then the second one, uh, that actually came out too sweet. And so I, for the second one, I like toned it down a little bit. Um, I mean, a lot of people liked the really sweet version, but I wanted it to be a little less sweet. And I also wanted to have more texture. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. It usually gets like too pureed or too too smooth, so I, I like left the skins on and I like didn't mash it quite as much and it actually came out really really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I actually I forgot that you shouldn't use a like a a strong mixer for normal potatoes and I did mm -hmm. it and they came out super duper gluey. Nobody yeah. else minded like except for me, which was great. But yep, <laughs> I was like oh I ruined the potatoes. <laughs> Thanksgiving is canceled, I guess. But everyone yeah. was like, oh, these are great. I was like, oh, OK, I guess I'm a genius. Yeah, I threw some um, some uh, almonds covered in butter and brown sugar over the top. And then I broiled it, hoping to like brown the almonds. And I ended up charring like a big section of them. And I was like, no, I have ruined it. And then everyone was like, no, it's great. It's like a nice contrast. Yeah. I was like, but it's ruined. <laughs> high, high expectations, right? Exactly. Um. It's, I hold myself to a higher standard than anyone else. Broilers can be dangerous. They're very, they sure can. They cook very quickly. They do. Yeah. I made the mistake of emptying the dishwasher while the broiler was on. <laughs> yeah. You have to be there watching it very yeah. vigilantly. <laughs> yeah. um, speaking of uh, broiling, uh, let's get into the questions this month. Okay. <laughs> um, and we have a bit of an interesting one here uh, to start us off. Um, their original question is actually, can you make a page about the common misconceptions so that I can share them? However, I think it would be more interesting to actually talk about them. Um, and so here's their full question from um, Victon. 
I like to visit different language learning communities on the internet and often see potentially productive discussions hamstrung by misconceptions people have about refold or immersion learning in general. Mm -hmm. Someone will maybe criticize refolds for forbidding grammar study or encouraging incomprehensible input, at which point the conversation switches to what is and isn't part of the refold philosophy. The FAQ touches on a few of these topics, but it would be really nice if there was a specific page where refolds views on these misconceptions were laid out. That way, whenever someone strawmans immersion learning, they can be simply sent to the correct part of that page. Perhaps it could be done as a community effort or I wouldn't, but I, I wouldn't really mind contributing to it. Yeah, uh, so first question or first answer, yes, we can definitely create a page like that. Uh, we will have to start collecting them, but we have been doing a lot of collection recently, so I can just add that to the list of things to look out for. Um, and we may want to create a segment or a section in the community just to start dropping those in there. Um, because we see common misconceptions all over Reddit and uh, Twitter and YouTube. Literally comments, anyone so. has a conversation about language. Learning. Yeah, I mean, but that's the internet for you, right? Like everything is, a mis <laughs> everybody has misconceived notions. Um, so uh, a couple common ones are, uh, some people think that the, what we're advocating for is that you don't do any study whatsoever and you just spend a huge amount of time with the language just by like watching incomprehensible TV shows. Um, so that's probably the most common one that we see. Um, another is that sort of an ex extension or corollary to that is that, uh, you can do like vocab study and immersion, but you can't do grammar study, um, because that like somehow messes up your, uh, mental model of it. Um, and then there are some folks who think we're very militant about the no speaking rule. So, uh, they think, oh, I, I, I will not consider anything that you're advocating for because you say not to speak and I need to speak or I want to speak. And that is not what we're advocating for. We're, if, if speaking is your goal and you need to do it or you want to do it earlier, then do it. Um, just do it with the uh, cognizant of what that means to do it early. Um, so I think those are probably like the three top misconceptions. Ben, can you think of any other ones? Not off the top of my head. There's There's a couple others of like whether or not you should you should just jump right into native content or use beginner content mm -hmm. um, there's some around immersion learning in general um but i i think those those are the main ones that i see as well sure um, i think the biggest one that often causes discussions um is the grammar one um yeah. specifically yeah, um, i think <clears throat> yeah tagging on to what you just said uh another one is just that uh learner materials are off limits you know, a lot of people think that because um, there's this the, been an idea for a long time that like, oh, natives don't speak like learner materials speak. Therefore, you shouldn't learn use learner mm -hmm. materials. We don't have that same militants. Like that is something to consider and to keep in mind. But when you're at the early stages, you want something that's easier because that's going to smooth the process of you actually integrating into the language and help you get to the point where you can enjoy native content a lot faster. Absolutely. So um, and I'm not worried about someone learning bad uh habits from learner materials because it's such a small part of the entire process exactly um another thing just to mention like in the discord rules rule number it's very early on rule number th three is that refold is a method not a dogma it's okay to deviate um and you can absolutely talk about them and talk about why like that's totally fine. That's a normal process. We understand that every single person on earth is going to learn slightly differently. Um, and we want to just at least help them find that way that works best for them. Yeah, exactly. Um, we sort of see ourselves as just trying to connect the right learner to the right methods and the right tools at the right time. Um, and those right methods and right tools are going to be different per person based on their interests, what they, you know, what they like to do, what technology they have available to them whether they can spend money, whether they can't. Like there's so many different factors that we have to consider when making recommendations about what the right thing is to the right person. So you're saying that all those videos that claim to have the best language learning method aren't true? <laughs> I've, I've had this conversation recently. Like I really don't like the word best because it's impossible to be best in every category, right? 
And so when you say best, you are automatically saying we are best in some category, but you're not saying what that category is. Um, so it's just a really imprecise word. I really wish people would be more precise with what they mean by like most optimized for X, Y, and Z. I know it's too many words for a marketing slogan, <laughs> but it um, it's, I, I wish people would just be more forthright with like what they're actually prioritizing. Totally. Best line, best method for X, Y, Z would even yeah, be better it, than just Duolingo that. has, Duolingo's slogan is like the best method for language learning. Um, but what they really mean is like the best method for getting people into language learning. Well, I think you're the best. Thanks. <laughs> Moving on to the next question here. Um, we have one from Afro. Uh, what are the main differences between level five and level six comprehension on the roadmap? Uh, they, I, I find myself often struggling to differentiate between the two, especially when I move between them during uh, comprehension of content. Uh, does level six mean that you understand literally everything? Question mark. Yeah, so first off, the levels are arbitrary. Like we just drew arbitrary lines in the sand. So there is no strict difference between any of the levels. Um, I also would like to change the comprehension levels listed because um, what we've realized is this, that, that this like level of perfection that's described by level six is just so rare, even in your native mm -hmm. language. There are yeah. things that like you don't understand or you don't know the words or you don't get the reference. So there are plenty of times in English when I do not have level six comprehension as it's defined in the, um, in the guide. So what I've sort of been trying to shift us towards is about a level of comfort and automaticity. So this is true both for the comprehension side and then also for the writing and speaking side. So basically how hard do you have to think in order to understand the thing? Um, because sometimes there's a word that you don't know, but you can understand the thing fine. And sometimes you know all the words, but you have to think really hard in order to understand it. Mm -hmm. And so what we're really trying to get you to is a place where you can comfortably understand something uh, without thinking about it completely automatically, without translating, uh, and that you can keep up with the speed of that thing, whatever it is. So um, the, the shift that I'm trying to make now is get you to a place where you have level five comprehension where you basically understand everything. And then the next phase is uh, that you can understand everything super easily uh, without any thought, et cetera. And when I say everything, you know, loosely speaking, let's say 99.9%. Um, so one in, uh, actually let's say 99% sentence level comprehension. It's also hard to put like any kind of literal number on it um, yeah. because like an example, I'm um, watching with my partner a, a sitcom from the '90s. It's full of references I'm never going to get. They're yeah. they're about celebrities from that era. That is, mm -hmm. but like I know the words they're saying. I just don't know who they're referring to. That sort yeah. of thing. It's like, is that comprehension or not? It's 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 all this, this gray area. But it's about the the ease of it all, just flowing through your brain without really any filter there. Yeah, I mean. Uh... As an example, I recently uh, was shown this web series from these Australian comedians. And I do not have level six comprehension because I'm working really hard to understand their accents. And then there is a bunch of references in there that I just do not know. Um, so, you know, my, my comprehension level dropped quite a lot <laughs> when I started watching that show just because I have to get used to the accent and the words that they're using. And I don't know the cultural context. Totally. Yeah. Um, I also see that Afro just joined the, the stream. Uh, you can just hit the uh, rewind button a little bit, put it on two times speed and watch the entire thing. Yeah. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question here. Oh, thanks for uh, the question, Afro. From Bleaker. How do I relearn a language I partially forgot? Hey, I was wondering if there is any way that having previously learned and forgotten most of a language would help or hinder my progress. Do you have any, any idea about what I might expect that progress, that process or progress to be like? I have previously taught myself Spanish solo through audio input and was wondering what I might expect with Hebrew uh, because I was taught modern Hebrew to a conversational level in primary school up to the age of 11, but pretty much completely lost it when I was in secondary school. Um, I've been trying to get it back recently and whilst there is something there, it's vague and mostly just sentence structures and random words. 
Sure. Yeah, I don't know how old this person is or how long of a gap it's been, but um, I know plenty of people who stopped uh, a, speaking a language when they were young mm -hmm. and completely lost it. Um, so basically, the, the earlier in your life that you learned it and then lost it, the worse off you're going to be, because as far as I can tell, your brain is just like, this is not important information and I'm going to drop it entirely. Whereas people who have learned a language as an adult and then, you know, drop it for a decade, when they come back, it's actually quite easy to regain. So um, I think that's sort of the, the distinction here is when did you learn it and how long has it been since you forgot it? Um, there is um, evidence that some things like will never really go away. Like some mm -hmm. phoneme recognition can almost always be there. Um, but yeah, in general, like a lot of vocab and stuff like that can totally just vanish. Yeah. Um, I'd expect this person to still be able to read the written script of Hebrew and um, they will probably have an easier time with it than a, someone starting from absolutely nothing. But I would basically treat it like a normal, any other language that you might learn. You might get some, you know, 10, 20% speed boost on it from what you had. Um, but because it's been so long and because you are already noticing that like it's basically gone from your memory, you kind of have to treat it just as like a, a brand new language. Yeah. And then maybe along the way, you'll find a little place where like, oh, I actually do know this already. I can just move on. Um, yeah. But it's not really a very different process, just maybe yeah. a slight bit easier. And like you said, with the, the phoneme recognition, you might find that your listening ability is better than it otherwise would be just because you did have that experience as a, a child, even though you've lost the sort of mental framework of the language. Yeah. Great. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. Uh, next question here um, from Alvarez King is re-listening beneficial? Is it beneficial to re-listen to something you've missed a couple of times? And if it still doesn't click, check the subtitles, um, et cetera. And can you understand it through doing this? Do you think this practice can improve one's listening skills? Yes, they can definitely improve one's listening skills. Um, this is actually a, a technique that we recommend when you're in the listening phase of the process. So the, the new structure of the, uh, of the roadmap that we're using uh, with our, our clients and with our course participants is focusing on um, recognition first and then reading and then reading quickly and then listening and then listening quickly. And in the listening phase, you've got um, a, this, you know, the general just like free flow listening that you might do listening to audiobooks, podcasts, etc. But most people have found it very beneficial, myself included, to re-listen to the same thing over and over again. So I have an app on my phone where I can be listening to something and if I come across a sentence that I don't understand, I can actually just loop it. So I can just put an input and an output and it'll just loop it over and over and over again. And I find that typically within you know five re-listens, I can start to parse it. Occasionally there's some mumbling or slurring that takes me a lot longer, but I find that that really, really helps to develop an intuition for the what people are saying and really nail down those um, phonemes that you're struggling to hear. Um, so yes, uh, intensive re-listening is a great way to improve your listening ability. Um, it's not the only way and you shouldn't only do that, but it is very useful. Um, and then chorusing is a, a basically doing intensive re-listening, but then trying to make the sounds at the same time. And that's another good way to develop a feedback cycle of, are you actually hearing things properly? Because what a lot of folks find is they think they're hearing it properly, but when they try to say it back, it actually sounds different than what they were expecting. Uh, and that's because our brains make interpolations into what things are, and it will make up sounds that it thinks people are saying that they aren't actually saying. And that happens quite often when um, folks uh, merge the sounds of two different words together, or they drop part articles or particles. Um, and, you know, you, you hear the sentence, you can uh, imagine all the words in that sentence. And when you try to re-say it and compare it to what they actually said, you realize, oh, they didn't actually say all the words that should be in that sentence. Um, because human speech is messy and not grammatically correct a lot of times, and people drop words and sounds all the time. So um, it's, it's beneficial to um, do both the intensive re-listening and the chorusing um, as a way to make sure that you're actually hearing the right things. 
totally. Great. Thank you for the question. Uh, next one, similar, is transcribing a good way to develop your listening skills. What are y'all's thoughts on practicing listening skills by transcribing a piece of audio? I'd like to spend more time intensively listening to audio to boost my listening skills. And just repeating the audio alone is not doing a lot to improve my comprehension. Um, I've been thinking about giving transcription a try, but I'm not sure how effective it would be. Yeah, so this is something that Matt and I actually disagreed about. Uh, I actually, I think transcription is a great activity. It forces you to really pay close attention and uh, in an interactive way that you can then cross-reference to an actual text. So it gives you immediate feedback as to whether you, you actually understood the whole sentence. Um, Matt's concern was basically what I just mentioned, where the grammatically correct thing that is technically like the transcription um, is maybe not matching what the person actually said. It may be what they meant to say, but it's not actually what they said. And so you get into the situation where you can potentially transcribe something that is correct and matches the transcription, but is not actually what the person said. And so your brain can then, um, uh, doesn't actually pay attention to the sounds and what the person actually said and how the language is actually spoken. So he had some concerns that if you were trying to force everything into the written text, um, you're not actually pay att paying attention to the reality of what the person is doing, um, which I think is a legitimate concern. I just think that the benefits of transcribing as an activity outweigh that concern. Um, and this is, you know, Matt and I have very different opinions about what you should optimize for in the language learning process. Um, he is very focused on accuracy of the spoken language, and I'm very focused on um, being able to pay attention to it and to enjoy yourself and to make sure that you are um, getting feedback that can help you correct. Um, and so based on our different prioritizations, you know, he has his opinion about transcription and I have mine. So you'll have to decide which of those you align with more. But if you're finding that the intensive re-listening is just not holding your attention, then yes, transcribing will definitely help you with that. Yeah, I think that's that's the good thing to hone in on is like the being able to do something very specific often is helpful for just focusing reasons. Um, and especially if you're not doing only transcription is your only form of immersion, like having it be one of the things that you do is just seems like a, a useful thing if it's if it's fun and engaging for you. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for the question, Moth. Moth. Uh, next question here. This is an interesting one. My language doesn't have a lot of resources. Should I learn a different, more related language instead? Um, if there are only a few learning resources available for a given language, do you think that it's worth learning um, something else? Oh, I get their question now. Um, I didn't understand the first time. Okay, let me restart. Um, if a language doesn't have a lot of resources, should I learn a different related language to that language first? So their question here is, uh, it's not even should I give up. Uh, yeah. Do you think that it's worth learning a closely related language with high mutual intelligibility um, that does have a lot more learning resources to then be able to switch later to something else that doesn't really have anything for beginners that they actually want to learn? So, for example, here, um, they might if they ultimately want to learn Luxembourgish, maybe starting with regular German is better because then you can just go right into whatever there is in Luxembourgish rather than trying to find the one beginner material. So it's actually not, should I give up? It's something else. Yeah, should you learn a language through another language? Should I go the scenic route? <laughs> That's what I um, All right, so there's, there's not a simple answer to this one. It's gonna really depend on your goals and your motivations and what keeps you engaged. Mm -hmm. So if you're finding that you don't like any of the uh, the content that's available in your language um, because it's pretty limited or it's not interesting to you and you're, you're struggling to focus on it, then it's not gonna be a good use of time forcing yourself to sit down and do that. Um, you're just gonna learn really, really slowly and you're not going to enjoy yourself. So if that is the position that you are in, then yes, going through a language that you have um, many more options with and where you're going to enjoy yourself, uh, is a great first step towards learning the second language. 
Uh, first off, because they're related and potentially mutually intelligible, so there's a lot of shared stuff between them, but also because you learn how to learn. And the, the first language you learn is the hardest. It's the one where you have to figure out what is the process. Once you have those skills, they're pretty applicable to any language. So um, getting practice with learning will help you learn a second language, and getting practice with a language that's related will help you learn that second language more rapidly. Um, the only reason you wouldn't want to do that is if you really, really wanted to be sort of perfect in your lesser spoken language without having the influence of a second language potentially confusing you. Um, there, you're going to end up making mistakes where you transfer German over to Luxembourgish because they're sort of a little bit mixed together in your head. Um, that's just kind of a reality if you learn two languages that are very close to each other. Um, in in a Spanish in Spanish world, it's you know the different dialects. You know, there's tons of slang that is used or words that are used in different dialects, and it's if you don't focus on just one, you definitely start mixing in um, the vernacular from the other dialects. It's something that I do all the time and it confuses people because I'll use like Spain, Mexican, and uh, Colombian slang mixed together, um, which can cause problems. Uh, so it really depends on your specific situation. Based on the, the way that you phrase the question, my guess is yes, it would be worthwhile going for the one that is uh, German first uh, learn how to uh, learn a language, learn the structure of the language, because I assume that's shared between the two, and learn enough of the vocabulary that there's a lot of cognates so that it's shared over, so that when you do switch over to the second language of Luxembourgish, you will be able to just do, you know, the, the process will be, say, 20% or 30% of the size that it would be if you were just starting with it from day one. Yeah. Um, personal example is actually coming across Slovak, um, which is very related to Czech. Um, it actually looks quite different, but it sounds pretty similar. And I've noticed that I already can comprehend stuff, right? So like, I probably wouldn't have to start with beginner things. Like I would basically just have to kind of transfer the stuff that is different, like the spelling and the, the phonemes, and then be like, all right, I guess I can just start watching TV shows without a huge problem. Um, and so if you can kind of get to that level where jumping down to the next language isn't a huge jump, um, that's when it's going to be a lot easier to, to use what content is available and try to enjoy it that way. Um, but yes, definitely agree with the idea that it's not a simple answer because it really depends on your own personal goals, situation, et cetera, et cetera. And that question is from Bella Gessa. Bella Gessa. No, I don't want to say it, but thank you very much for the question. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the question. Next one here is, should I use kids' content as a first domain? Refold seems to recommend moving to native uh, slice of life TV shows for adults as soon as possible, um, but before uh, reaching five to six comprehension in much more basic content. Um, if strong listening comprehension is so important to overall progress, why skip to adult materials before you feel like you've got a really good grasp of the very basic stuff? I like to use uh, most of what I read and watch is passive listening audio later, and I feel like I'm wasting my time when doing that with adult TV shows. Um, in contrast, I can get a lot from kids' content well, because there's only one to three unknown words per minute. Um, I'm compreh comprehending more sentences when passively listening and much more easily able to hear and understand the words that I'm learning, um, that I'm still learning. Chinese has such a wealth of native of kids' material that I can't fully... Um, and that I can't fully comprehend native materials. Uh, so why would I want to move on to that slice of life adult content? Wouldn't the smoothest and quickest path uh, be to mastering a wide variety of kids content just as a native child might do? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think this is a perfectly legitimate approach uh, if you want to stay with easier kids content. Kids content is native content. It's just easier. And it's um, usually slower paced and the only danger with it is that uh, it uses language that is not common in adult content and you won't be coming across often. That's more of a problem with like baby level. Um, in the guide, we talk about this sort of adolescent range where it's like seven to 10 year old is the, the target demographic. And that's sort of really perfect content to get started with. So uh, for me, that was Avatar The Last Airbender. Like I 
watched that twice in Spanish and then I re-listened to the audio of that probably three times. And um, by the third listen of that though, I was not getting anything out of it. Uh, you very quickly level up through that. So you don't want to stay in it until you're like perfect because that's sort of when you're wasting your time. But if you're at a level where native content is like way too hard and you don't feel like you're getting anything out of it and you have a wealth of kids content that's in, you're enjoying and that you are understanding, uh, then yeah, 100% go down that route. Just don't stay in there forever. Uh, remember, at some point you need to level up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you don't want to be, you don't want to get stuck um, in sort of a safe zone and then always be scared to move on to something that's harder. To use another, I guess, personal anecdote for my check learning, I am using adult sort of slice of life TV show sitcom, um, but I'm doing it much more slowly and working on every sentence, sentence mining, that sort of thing. Uh, but when I'm switching to sort of full listening, I'm also planning to incorporate a lot of uh, these fairy tale movie TV shows. I think they're mostly movies from all over Europe, it seems like. There's a bunch of these um, just general like fairy tales that are turned into movies. Um, and I, I quite like that sort of thing. And I'm really excited to dive into that because they're they're for kids, but also for the whole family. And so they have easier language and some of them are even dubs so that you get like that really crisp audio um, so that I can, and none of them have subtitles. So I have to like have to listen. Um, so I'm, I'm personally really looking forward to doing that because it will be a little easier, but also a little harder at the same time and still has this interest and cultural significance to the language. Um, and so, especially if you can find easy, fun and engaging stuff, like Ethan said, I think that could, that can actually just be a really motivational as well because you do understand more and you're like, okay, I'm actually getting the entirety of this TV show rather than like a couple of lines here and there. Yeah, cool. And then oh. if um, if you sort of look at like what people do right now, uh, especially in the Japanese community, a lot of anime is relatively simple. Um, it's not super complicated. There, there are complicated ones like Attack on Titan, but um, <laughs> the and like Death Note. But the average anime is much simpler than two natives talking to each other. So they're already doing that. They're not doing it with like kids shows. It's just that the adult, um, the content that is meant for adults is often very simple, just in the anime genre. I don't know if that's true in. Um, a, I think they said they were studying Mandarin, correct? I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if that is true in the yeah. uh, you know animated shows in Mandarin um, or in you know native TV shows, whatever it is. Uh, so sticking with kids content is a sort of the equivalent thing to just using an easier uh, piece of content for adults. Yeah, just looking at like the JPDB, uh, some of these anime seem to have like only a couple hundred words sure it looks like they're like one episode but that's so different from somebody's conversation about their their trip to the the countryside with their family and what they did for the holiday sure, like sure, sure. there's gonna be so many random little words in there mm -hmm. um but so that's a good example mm -hmm. um great thank you for the question curdle uh let's move on to this fun question here are our tools too good? Remember the good old days? A guy is playing Final Fantasy in Japanese on his Nintendo. It's the 90s out there. He encounters a new word, and what does he do? He reaches for his physical dictionary, searches the word by radicals, and by the way, he knows that he knows them by numbers. He knows he knows them by numbers by heart. After a minute, he finally finds the word. What does he do now? Or what about now? I have my visual novel with a text hook that streams the text directly into the place where I have an amazing pop-up dictionary and lookups happen within a second. Of course, we all prefer better and faster tools, but do you think that there that those such lookups don't leave any trace in our memory? The guy from the 90s probably memorized the word much better while looking up in that funny little paper dictionary. This question is from Yuri. Judy. Yeah, it's um, you know, it sounds like sort of a facetious question, but it uh, it's actually a very uh, intelligent and serious one, because there is this link between the amount of effort you spend to do something and how strong the memory is. Um, so that is a very real premise, and if you are using the tools and 
relying so much on them that you're not actually processing the language, then you are uh, at risk of not actually learning the language because the tool is too good. Um, that's more of a risk if you're doing full sentence translations, and that's why we don't really recommend using uh, full sentence translations because you are likely to just kind of forget the intermediate level. And if you don't actually work for understanding the language in its native form, and you just you know translate it and then look at the translation, your brain is not going to commit that to memory. Uh, or if it does, it's just gonna be very loose memory. So the tools have become so easy and so frictionless that you no longer have to do the work to do the lookups, but um, there is still a lot of work in the process. Mm -hmm. If you're sitting down and you're trying to decode a sentence using the translations of just individual words, then you are actively working to uh, understand. Yeah. And so as long as you are still doing work, then you're still gonna continue to learn, you're still gonna continue to form memories. If you find yourself that it is too easy, you're not putting in the time to think through things. Um, and this is a problem that we've had with a lot of our clients where we sit down and watch them go through this process. And they're not actually spending the time and doing the mental exercise of trying to decode the language. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to see results. There are some clients that have been do doing the immersion um, process and the lookup process, the decoding process for you know a year, and they're like, I'm not making any progress. And then we watch them do it, and we realize they're not actually thinking. They're not actually uh, doing the work mentally. They're just kind of either uh, cursory looking things up, saying, oh, I don't get it, and then looking at the translation, or they're saying, I don't get it, and they're just moving on. And once we show them the process of really working with the language, uh, a couple things happen. One, immersion becomes way harder <laughs> and way more tiring for them. Um, the the One of our clients said it felt like he had been doing the reps at the gym wrong this whole time, like with the wrong form. And suddenly now he's doing the right form and he's exhausted. You're just using the, the, the 45 pound bar, <laughs> didn't actually put any weight on. Yeah, or like just like, just doing the wrong motion. <laughs> um, In theory, that's still hard. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so the other thing is the, um, you want to make sure that your brain is working. And the way that you experience that is either you will get tired, you will get what we call brain melts, where your brain is just like, feels like it's falling out of its, you know, out of your head. Um, you may even, I got headaches when I first got started. So if you're not experiencing any sort of, mental discomfort, then you're probably not growing. So it's not so much that the tools are too good, it's just that the tools removed any of the pre-existing barriers that required you to do mental work. And now it's up to you to choose to do the mental work. And you will make much faster progress if you choose to do the mental work. Yeah, and I think that the thing here is that if the tool doesn't necessarily make the make you do the work um and actually i think the the possibility of using a tool that is too basic can make you think that you're doing the work even if you're not because you're like oh i looked up the word in the dictionary it took me a whole 90 seconds to find it that that was the work right whereas you have to like still find that difficulty with a tool that instantly finds the thing to help you understand um so question is not really fully answered um but you know what i really. mean i answered it <laughs> yeah but like <laughs> it still depends on their on their uh situation and how they use the tools right and so like for some people maybe those instant lookups are too good and then it's actually not gonna they're just gonna always go the easy way and be like all right i just am able to look up the sentence and just understood it because it's in english now mm -hmm. um and for them maybe they they shouldn't be using that sort of thing whereas yeah yeah. Uh, recently I've been uh, getting into weightlifting and there's this um, concept of like exertion level, of, like how hard you think something is. So um, one of the, the concepts that I've come across is, you know, how many reps do you have left in the tank uh, mm -hmm. as a way to imagining the exertion. So rather than looking at the exact number, you look at like, how hard was this thing? And we kind of want to do the same thing with language learning. You want to see how hard was this experience? 
How much did I work mentally? Because that is when you push yourself. And when you push yourself, you grow. If you're not pushing yourself, you're probably not growing. You might be solidifying skills uh, and making them more automatic, but you're not actually growing outside of your current abilities. Cool. I think that's a good end for that. Thank you. Um, next question here. Uh, another relatively common one to get from people. Um, how do you justify not focusing on speaking, especially early on? Um, this is from Kale Chips. So this person is not introverted. They said they're not introverted at all. I really enjoy conversation, but I can't just jump into it at my stage. Um, I don't really want to. I'm trying to get to a thousand hours of input before I really start focusing on my output. But I bump into a lot of native speakers and other language learners. How do I explain to them that I'm not crazy for not wanting to work on my speaking while I'm a terrible speaker? <laughs> yeah, this one's hard because it's so common wisdom. Um, ben and I, when, we, when I was visiting him in a, a Mexico City, we were in a taxi and we told the taxi driver that we work for a language learning company. And he's like, oh, you know, speaking is how you learn a language. Like, you know, that that's really what you got to do. And honestly, Ben and I were just like, uh, well, like, let's just not even argue about it. Um, you can let us off of here at the corner. It's fine. <laughs> we'll walk. Yeah. You know, the best you can say is like, ah, oh, yes, we speaking is good, but, you know, understanding is a higher priority for us. Um, so it really depends on like whether this is a passing conversation or whether this is someone who's sitting down and like really wants to talk about language learning with you. So if it's just a passing conversation, I would not bother even saying anything at all. Um, or at a minimum, just being like, yeah, speaking is cool, but like understanding is in, in more important in my opinion. Um, and the way that I often say this is like, uh, I can't participate in a conversation if I can't understand you. So even if I can speak, if I can't understand you, then, you know, what's the point? Um, if you are sitting down with someone who has a very strong opinion about speaking early and they actually want to have the conversation with you, uh, then you can sort of get into the details of what it means. Um, I unfortunately don't have like a very great answer for this. This is kind of something you got to figure out with whether you even want to have these conversations with people. Um, the, there are so many opinions about language learning out there and uh, a lot of them I disagree with. And sometimes it is just not worth having the conversation at all. Um, or what I often do is I will, rather than trying to convince somebody that they're wrong, I will just try to add things to their worldview. Um, so rather than saying, you know, you shouldn't speak early, um, you can say, hey, you know, speaking's great, but understanding is important and people tend to overlook it. So, uh, you know, I tr choose to pay more attention to that side of things. Um, yeah, putting the other thing you can do positive spin on it. What do you, what are you doing instead is often very helpful. It's like mm -hmm. the, when people say, "Oh, I didn't understand eighty percent of everything." It's like, "Well, forget about that. The, you understood twenty percent of the thing, or whatever this yeah. thing is." <laughs> in this case, it's like, "Oh, I'm actually just choosing to focus on on understanding first. I really want to understand everything that's going on." Then they can be like, "All right, cool." Rather than be like, "I'm not speaking." It's, it's the same thing, but it's it's different. Yeah. And I cut you off. What was your, the rest of your... Oh, the other thing I was going to say is you can cheat. You can just memorize a couple uh, set phrases or like basic um, speaking sentences, you know, basic conversation. And usually that's enough to get people off your back. <laughs> like, they don't even expect you to have a conversation. They expect you to be like, hi, how are you? What do you do for work? Like the really, really simple small talk, which you can learn in an afternoon. Um and if you can do that, then they're just like, great, you're done. Like that's, that's language learning. Um, so if you really just want to avoid the whole thing entirely, like learn the basics and then you should just make them happy and walk away. Reaffirm their worldview. Yeah. <laughs> great. Thank you for the question. Um, another question from, um, Belay's, I think Belay's, Belay's, Be they put their name in the chat, like how to say it, Belais, Belaisa, but I don't really know how to read it because it's <laughs> just written like that. So I apologize again. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why this is confusing me so much. Anyways, uh, their question is, 
How important is comprehensibility? Have you guys noticed any differences between learners who immerse primarily in content for which they have a very low comprehension, say 20 to 20, 10 to 20%, as opposed to those who only consume highly comprehensible content, say 80 to 90%? Uh, Matt versus Japan even argued in the video that the former might be better, but I don't know either way. Yeah, I'm not sure which video uh, this person is referencing. I'm also not um, sure. There's um, generally comprehensibility is important. I think we can just sort of start with that. Uh, more comprehensible things definitely provide more value. Um, but as I was talking about in a in earlier question, uh, it really matters how much effort you're putting in. So when it comes to expanding your ability, effort is more important than comprehensibility. But when it comes to solidifying your ability, comprehensibility is more important. So that when I think about the, the language learning process or really any skill that you're doing, there's the process of learning how to do the thing and there's, there's, there's a process of uh, making it automatic. Um, and the, the quote that I like is, um, uh, amateurs practice until they can do it perfectly, whereas professionals practice until they can't do it imperfectly. Um, so it's the idea that it becomes so ingrained in who you are that it's just completely automatic. You literally cannot do it wrong. Um, and so what I would say is comprehensibility for growing your skills and learning how to do the thing can be helpful, but is not necessarily a requirement. But comprehensibility for cementing your skills and making them perfect, really automating everything about uh, your language understanding or speaking, um, then, or rather, understanding comprehensibility is going to be very important for that. Yeah. Um, there can be times when incomprehensible things are important because it allows you to detach from the uh, what you think the language is and focus on what the sounds of the language are. And I think that's what Matt has advocated for in the past. It's really about how do you identify the phonemes and sounds as they are used in the language. And oftentimes our brains interfere with our own ability to hear things just by having the additional context. So incomprehensible things can force you to hear the language in a way that you would not otherwise hear if you actually knew what was going on. Um, I have heard him make that argument before. So it's unclear to me whether that's exactly what you're referring to, but I, I could imagine that might be it. Cool. Thank you. Um, no, there wasn't a related question. So we're going to go on to the next one then. Um, this one is from Clowfish, um, and they've slowed down their sentence mining. Uh, should they switch? Oh, wait, I should put the question on screen. Um, I used to mine at least 15 Anki cards in every 30 minutes, and I was binge watching for six hours um, and could even get to like 130 cards in a session. However, I now have diminishing results. Yesterday, I mined one card in 30 minutes, and two days ago, I only got 10 cards over three whole hours. Is it time to start switching to output or focus more on grammar, or should I narrow my focus even more? Uh, so first off, congratulations. That's awesome. Uh, that's a huge improvement, and that's exactly what you want to see. So uh, nice work. Sounds like you've really put in the time and energy and effort to uh, accomplish and, and reach this much higher level of comprehension. So uh, kudos to you. Um, what I would say is, yeah, you're basically at the point where you're ready to move on to the next level. And the next level for you, uh, or that we would advocate for, is listening. So if you're at the point where you can basically read the subtitles and there's an occasional word once every 30 minutes that you don't know or a sentence you don't understand, then you are definitely ready to move on to the next phase of the process. Um, the next phase of the process is to turn off the subtitles and start, instead of doing um, mining for uh, words that you don't know, mine sentences where you know all the words but can't understand the sentence on the first try. Um, the idea being that there's something about the phonetic structure in there or what you expect the sentence to sound like that is currently wrong in your head. And if you find those and you mine those instead, you'll start to focus on uh, building up that listening comprehension at a very high level. So uh, an audio card like that would have the audio sentence on the front and the transcription on the back. Um, 
The other thing that you can do is just intensive re-listening. So same deal, you come across a sentence that you don't understand, you just re-listen to it a couple times, um, see if you can understand it after a few tries. And then if you can, move on. If you can't, then check whether it's because you don't know a word or because you know all the words, but you can't hear them. Um, you're really trying to narrow in on where your mental framework for the sound system of the language is off uh, or uh, different than is expected uh, or different than is used in reality. Um, and then really start to do a lot of more free flow listening, uh, whether that's podcasts, audiobooks, etc. Uh, you want to get to a place where you can understand two native speakers speaking at full speed to each other without subtitles and have zero issue understanding them. And that's when we would say, okay, now go output. Um, up to you whether you want to wait that long, but that's sort of the, the criteria that we would use for when to switch to output. Cool. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. Um, in these last nine-ish minutes, ten-ish minutes here, I think we should go to the chat and answer some of the questions that we have from the live viewers. So if you That's have a great. question um, or you put one earlier and want to make sure that I see it, repost it. I'm going to go back to the top here because there's a couple that I see. Um, one that I actually had time to actually put on to a card. This comes from uh, Bachan Alpha. If you were to move to a Spanish-speaking country after about 1,000 to 1,500 hours of, of comprehensible input, how would you structure your year to ensure you maximize that exposure um, and immersion opportunity of being in another country? Uh, for Spanish, that's probably enough input that I would just switch to output as much as possible. So um, I would practice output in the home, and then I would also practice output uh, out and about when I'm talking to people. Um, I'll also the... say I basically did this. <laughs> this is sort of why I got <laughs> this. Like I, I moved to Mexico at about 15, probably a little more, a hundred hours of, of input, um, with some output as well. Uh, but yeah, I would definitely say practice output and then go to inherently social events, uh, where there are a lot of Spanish speakers and just make, just like be there and try to make friends, be excited. Um, it's, it's been really, really helpful to do things like that. Um, I have a couple of different activities that I do a couple times a week where I go and it's primarily Spanish speakers and I'm there and we chat, we have conversations. Um, I learn words. It's, it's a really good way to surround yourself with the language. If you have that opportunity and you're already pretty good at the language, I see a humongous difference between how I interact with them versus how some of the other Americans that come in that interact with them. There's, there's one that actually works for, uh, I think the consulate. Um, and he very frequently just speaks in English. He understands okay in Spanish, but he, it's mostly like, Oh, what does this word mean? What is, what, what does this word mean? Versus like actually having a conversation, um, because he frequently can't put his thoughts into Spanish. And so he just switches right back to English. Um, However, that's not the end of the world if you really just can't output and you want to like have crosstalk. You can find people to do that with as well as you're building up your abilities to output. Uh, but yeah, my suggestion would be to find groups of people that can do activities together, whether it's playing board games, uh, doing dance classes, uh, cooking lessons, whatever it is, and just try to engage with the people there and take advantage of that being away and try not to have any English speaking friends. <laughs> Avoid them. Yeah. I, I would generally say anytime you're going through a, a major transition in the language, um, whether that's reading to listening or listening to speaking, focus on managing the transition. Um, in this case, moving to another country, focus on managing that transition uh, in terms of making sure that you're building a social circle for yourself, doing things that you enjoy, making yeah. friends. Um, and for the output side of things, making sure that you are practicing output on a regular basis. Um, and then once you've made it through that transition, you are feeling more comfortable in that, then you can start to integrate more of the study stuff back in. Um, but this, when you move to the country, the studying aspect is just not that important when you first mm -hmm. get there. It's much more important to just like establish a network, establish a home for yourself. And then when you start bumping up against things that are challenging for you, then you can integrate the studying back in and, um, uh, and, you know, whether that's input or whether that's grammar study or writing or whatever else. Uh, but really, you know, focus on managing the transition well. Cool. Thank you. 
Um, we have a question here from B. Relos. Hi, I got burned out from studying Japanese um, and especially from doing very intensive immersion. Is it possible to skip it or only use free full immersion coupled up with vocab study? They know about 2K words, about 2,000 words. Sorry, they got burned out on intensive immersion? Yeah, that yeah. brain melt stuff, essentially. Yeah, the brain melt stuff. You were talking about. Um, yeah, you're going to make slower progress. It is possible. Um, that's what a lot of people have done in the past. It just takes a long time. Uh, but it's also the kind of thing where you don't have to permanently put intensive on hold, right? You can take a three month break and just focus on enjoying yourself and being a little bit more relaxed with the language. You don't always have to be working at maximum effort. Um, in fact, I would almost argue against that um, because it's important to get give your brain a rest and uh, allow yourself to solidify the things that you already know. Um, if I were to sort of restructure my language learning going forward, what I probably end up doing is three months of very, very, uh, you know, brain melty, difficult work, and then three months of more relaxing, just spending time with the language, and then switch every three months um, to give my brain a rest. Because if I try to do a whole year straight of like super intensive mental things, I burn out. That's just the reality of it. So you got to do what's best for you to manage your long-term goals and your long-term sustainability. So if you want to take a couple month break from intensive and just focus on free flow because you're burned out on it, it's just like it feels awful to you, then yeah, go for it. Um, but you will make slower progress than if you were doing intensive. So I would recommend reintegrating it at some point. Yeah, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you can take that as an opportunity to watch the things where you do understand most of everything and really solidify that base. Um, I, I don't think there's, I think it's almost a good thing to have a, have a build your base, solidify, build your next base, solidify so that you really have this strong ability all the way up in the language and you're not, you don't really have as many gaps. Um, mm -hmm. so I, I think if you are just constantly pushing yourself forward, you can really easily have just little holes and gaps. You're like, I just don't know a couple of these like basic color terms because I just haven't really spent enough time with whatever it is, a uh, regular mm -hmm. slice of life. And I moved right on to um, cop shows or whatever it is. And so it can actually be, I think, a quite a beneficial thing to do. Yeah. What I would say is if you're going to focus on free flow and solidifying your base, use things that are more comprehensible rather than less yeah. comprehensible. Exactly. Uh, speaking of which, there's a question here from Ark. Um, how long would it take to learn Japanese purely through ALG style, just listening? Um, and uh, like 3,500 to 4,000 hours probably. Um, especially if, uh, if you're using mostly comprehensible input. Uh, there's somebody in the community who did that with Thai, where she just uh, did comprehensible input for, I think she said around 3,000 hours now. Um, and she can can produce language and sounds like a Thai person, but it's like, yeah, my output is really still pretty rusty and I can understand most things and I'm starting to work on that. Um, and so probably getting to like 4,000-ish hours is where you're like quite... Um, I guess, native-like in terms of your acquisition of the language. Uh, but it's going to be different for everybody, depending on your process, what you use, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, I, I don't have an example immediately for Japanese. There is an example from the G Dreaming Spanish community of a guy who did like six hours a day of Dreaming Spanish, six to eight hours a day of Dreaming Spanish, um, which is basically exclusively comprehensible input without intensive and without um, all of the the fancy stuff that we add um and i believe that he started uh speaking and communicating at around 1500 hours mm -hmm. and then he probably did another uh 500 hours of speaking practice additional to the the comprehensible input so it's definitely possible so in that case you're looking at like 2000 hours or so um for spanish i would actually expect to take a little longer than 4000 hours for Japanese, just because uh, from what we've seen, even people who go down the um, the more intensive study route where they're using all the tools, uh, they're not reaching high levels of fluency until that 3,500, 3, 4,000 hour mark. So if you're just doing comprehensible input, you're probably going to reach sort of that lower level um, functionally fluent at around that 4,000. That's what I was thinking of. But yeah, if, yeah, you, okay. if you're trying to get like further, obviously you're going to want to get to like 10K hours, but that's if you like kind of want to sound like you're from Japan or whatever. 
Yeah. Um, just, yeah, definitely. There's a huge range. Yeah. Um, I think we'll do, we'll do one more question here, but there's a couple in okay. here. If you are not in the Refold Discord uh, server, make sure to go to refold.link slash join um, to join the, the Discord server and put your question there if we didn't get to it. Um, because we do, we have, we're going to do one of these next month as well. Mm -hmm. We do it every month. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I like clockwork. We have a question here from Juan Zeta. Um, it is in Spanish, so I'll do my best to translate it live. <laughs> um, I know that you both speak Spanish. Um, so I, mo I moved on to watching TV shows to try to apply the vocabulary that I'd learned. Um, but I found myself against the reality that there are a lot of words that I don't know. Um, I had the idea that I didn't, uh, that I understood a lot, but kind of realizing that I don't actually understand a ton. Um, and they also said, as another question, I know that it is recommended to understand a word without thinking in the language, uh, or as it is in the language, but it seems very uh, difficult. And sometimes I feel, um, a veces siento que si hago, si... El Anki, a lo mejor no termina por... Ah, and if I pass the word in Anki, I don't actually learn it. I don't know it. Um, re reading Spanish and English is weirdly hard. <laughs> um, uh, you mean translating? <laughs> yeah, but like live. Yeah, live translating. Yeah. Anyways. <laughs> it's, it's a very difficult skill. Definitely requires a lot of practice. <laughs> the... the um, whatever, yeah. Go ahead. Do you want to summarize that? Because I, I didn't exactly follow it. Um... They're struggling to actually understand the words they learn in Anki in their in the TV shows. They see a word, they're like, "Oh, what does that word mean?" They look, they kind of then they look it up. They're like, "Oh, I knew that." Mm -hmm. Why? Yeah. So this is <laughs> how do I fix that? Yeah, this is the um, the aspect of sort of contextual knowledge where mm -hmm. you know something in Anki but you can't recognize it outside of it, um, and. The answer to that is to recognize it and understand it outside of Anki. Yeah. Um, you can spend more time thinking about it in Anki. That does seem to help some people. But the, the real answer is that you have to just spend more time with the real language. Yeah. Um, no amount of Anki study is going to make you understand things in the real language on your first try. Uh, you're mm -hmm. going to have to see it a number of times. Um, but the more times you experience that, we're like, ah, crap, I did know that. Then it's a... Um, the faster you will uh, learn that word for real. Uh, it just reinforces the memory pretty aggressively. Yeah, my um, thought experiment version is like, if somebody was to do 3,000 hours of Anki and no other, nothing else in a language, they would basically be at the level of a beginner. Like, sure, they could probably do certain things, especially if they'd studied them very specifically in Anki card, but like producing natural language that is completely unstudied is, is so different than if you just have, you've studied 20,000 Anki cards that have a different word on them sort of thing. There's a huge, like you have to uh, come across a word at least a dozen times in a natural sense to really kind of get an idea of it. And many words will take longer than that. And so it you should expect moving from Anki to immersion to be a little bit hard. And that's also why I say that if your Anki ends up, is getting harder, the answer is actually to do less Anki and more immersion rather than doing more Anki, even though it sort of seems uh, logical to do more memorization to make your Anki easier, that'll just make it harder. Yeah, what we tend to find is that the combination of immersion and Anki together is what really drives the best results. Yeah. Um, the more reinforcement you get in immersion, the easier Anki becomes, uh, whereas with, if it's just memorized information, it's very it fades so quickly. Um, but if it's something that you've encountered so many times that it's really become embedded in your subconscious, Anki becomes like a um, uh, super easy. You can just speed through the the cards as long as you've seen them a bunch of times. Totally awesome. Well, we are a little bit over time here. We're at an hour five minutes. Thank you all. Oh, excuse me for being here. Um, sorry, didn't, we didn't get to all your questions in the chat, but please put them into the uh, channel for questions and we'll get to them in December. Um, it was lovely to have you here, Ethan, chatting about these questions and for all of your Thanks, lovely Beth. questions. Um, and I'll let yep. you wrap things up. 
yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for attending. If you're not already subscribed, hit that like button and subscribe button. Um, and if you're looking for more support in your language learning journey, definitely check out our, uh, our course or our coaching. Um, we're happy to help you. We really want to uh, be there with you throughout your language learning process. So uh, check out the links in the description for uh, both of those. And uh, otherwise, we are good to go. Happy holidays, everybody. We'll see you in December. Um, and uh, talk to you soon. Bye, everybody. <laughs>